Thank you. So I'm um, in the hope that anything is going to be visible in this sunny day on the projection. So I'm Akos Marowi, I'm from Hungary, and uh, I'm very dedicated to flying. I actually flew here from Hungary uh, on Tuesday. I uh, landed at uh, Lelystad Airport, and I'm going to uh, talk about our project, which is called Open Aviation Maps. So, uh, but first, let's talk a little bit about aviation navigation information and, and what is this really about. So, is anything visible here? Not much, huh? Okay, so I'll be seeing what I see and you're not, so I, I mean, I guess what I talk is more important. So, what do you see on this picture? Nothing, because it's not, con con but still, if you can make anything out, what do you see there? Yeah, Budapest, there is a bridge, there is a river. Uh, it's kind of scenic, right? But actually what an aviator would see is something that you guys don't see on the projection. I don't know, there's not too many of us. Maybe if, if we just look at the screen of the laptop, then you can actually see what I wanted to show. Uh, so please come over. So this is what you would see when you're an aviator. And this red part is uh, restricted airspace number one. You're not allowed to fly there. And there's the control airspace for the Budapest main airport, which means you only fly in there if you have a permission. So this whole aviation nav thing is kind of a virtual reality thing that you have to see f stuff in the air which are just not there. Uh, so same scenario, the same area. This is the red part, which I showed on the picture. This is the CTR, this kind of yellowish part. This is the bridge, this is the river. Or the same thing with the satellite map underneath. And then these are already screenshots from our project, from the Open Aviation Map project. And this is the same with the 3D visualization. So this is like the hill in front, this is the bridge, these are the... Uh, uh, boats, if I go back to that, you see it's the boats, the bridge, and that's the, uh, it's called the Citadella. Uh, so that's here. And these are kind of the airspaces that are drew on the map manually. So why is this important? Navigation is important because, uh, uh, yeah, you, you need to get somewhere, so you have to be able to navigate there, right? That's kind of an important thing. Uh, you want to avoid... Yeah. Do you have the slides online? I will. Sure. Uh, not actually, I have it now as well. Uh, shall I show the URL? Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It should be here somewhere. Yep. No. This URL here, and they you should see a PDF file. Okay, it's the PDF, the only PDF file okay. in the in the in the folder. Okay, so so this is kind of important because you want to avoid dangerous place spaces. You want to plan your trips. You wanna you wanna be safe. And the basic rule of aviation is that you aviate, you navigate, and you communicate. So it's like the second most important thing when you actually fly. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to aviation nav data, uh, so what kind of data do we have? Uh, we have uh, airspaces, we have navigation points, which are sometimes real navigation points. So it's like some, there's something physical, some radio transmitter kind of thing on the ground. Sometimes you have GPS navigation points, which are points totally made up. There is no physical uh, uh, corresponding item on the ground for those points. We have airways, which are kind of paths that you fly through. And then we have procedures, basically, which are uh, you know, a series of navigation points that you have to follow. Uh, let me show an example of, uh, of an airspace definition as published by the, uh, the Hungarian authority. But it's this all of them are published in a similar manner. Maybe if I highlight this, uh, I can't highlight it now. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to show the text here. Basically, the text for this, uh, 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 for this airspace is it's a circle radius, three kilometers, and centered on, uh, and then there is a coordinate. 
uh, GPS coordinate. Now, this is how it looks in reality. That's Poksh, the big nuclear reactor in the middle of Hungary. And it's a very red area. You should not fly there, period, because they get angry at you. Uh, and I, I want to show another definition of how an airspace definition looks like. This is also something you can't read, so I'll read it up. Uh, it says that there is a. It starts with a specific coordinate. Then it says a clockwise, a clockwise arc uh, with a six-kilometer uh, radius centered on another coordinate. Then it is following the border of Austria and Hungary up until a third particular coordinate. And this, the, the green one, is how it looks like this one when you actually draw it. So that's the circular area, and here it is how the, it follows the uh, the border. So when you want to work with airspaces and this kind of navigation info, it's even though it seems sim simple, you just have points and, and spaces. Actually, some of these definitions are quite complex in terms of you have to get uh, existing data like a national border or a river, uh, which sometimes uh, spaces follow a river. Um, so entering these spaces into any kind of a, a sort of geospatial database is a bit challenging. Um, but this is what we do. So uh, why do we need this project, uh, this open aviation map project? Like, Isn't this stuff already available out there? I mean, people have been flying for over 100 years now. Uh, there's a lot of flights every day in Europe. Uh, yeah, it's out there, but not in an open manner. So basically, the state of the affairs currently is that uh, you have uh, uh, it's government agencies which will publish this kind of data. The, the way it's published, it's unusable. It's basically this textual description, what I read up earlier. During flying, it's very difficult to interpolate with circular angles and stuff like that, and then you don't know the national border anyway. So it, you can't use it as it is being published by the government. And of course, there are commercial companies who supply this kind of information to commercial airlines and stuff. The, the thing, the, there, it's basically there's a single monopoly who, do, who does that, uh, and, of, and accordingly, it's kind of pricey too. Yep. The airlines do it as well. Themselves. No, they buy it from Jeppesen. From the. Yeah, most of them do. Not, not all. Um, so. Uh, what is this project about? It's a combination of tools and data, and it's a project very much in progress. Uh, what tools do we have? So let me run down on what we have done so far. We have a set of Java tools, uh, uh, which are conversion tools from various formats uh, into basically an OpenStreetMap style PostGIS database. Uh, we can also export to AIXM, which is a, which is a kind of new XML format, which is being championed by the FAA and Eurocontrol now. And then we have rendering tools which can draw the map which I showed you earlier. Uh, we can also draw paper maps, like big paper maps with different projections, so not just the web-based projection, but also uh, Lombard, Conic, and Mercator projections. Um, uh, we have an Android app, so you can use it in flight, uh, which is good. And then we have a WebGL-based prototype, basically, which is a, a 3D uh, representation in, in running in a browser. So the jo our Java tools, which is kind of the boring thing, uh, so it's a lot of conversion tools, conversion routines. It's about parsing XML files or text files, and then you basically pu put out other XML files and text files. The funky thing about it is that it can, uh, it can recognize and, and understand some of these complex definitions, like taking a national border and combining it with an airspace part, and then it's going to automatically uh, output the, the proper uh, airspace boundaries, and and uh, we have uh, a lot of rendering uh, features basically set in. Uh, so what what you have when you import this data in a the spatial database like PostGIS, uh, then after that you want to render it maybe to a bitmap, uh, uh, and how uh, we're using a tool set called GeoTools to do that for us, and it has this uh, styling language called uh, Styled Layer Descript Descriptor SLD. And basically, we have a command line tool which is just calling into GeoTools with these uh, SLDs to render the the, the, uh, the maps. Uh, now, only if this was so simple as I just said, because it's not. Uh, all these rendering tools, uh, they have a lot of challenges because they were created to create map uh, tool set, map map tiles. So basically, the the original Google Map kind of you know bitmaps which are tiled together and then we just load the new ones. Um, which means that there are a lot of times it's actually not good for us. Uh, uh, one of some of the issues uh, we have is that uh, is uh, one is labeling. So because they render it tile by tile, each each tile it doesn't know if the tile next to it is going to be rendered. 
So if it finds that there has to be a label to be rendered, each of them will render it in that small tile. Now, if you have a huge area, then you're going to have a, you're going to have a zillion labels saying the same thing, which is annoying. So then you have to do, do what is called meta tiling, basically you create a big tile and then cut it up later, and then hopefully this double labeling uh, issue will go away. Um, so that's one of the issues we have. Uh, another issue which which we which was very painful for us is that. These uh, rendering tools, they are uh, focused on rendering on a web onto a, uh, well into a bitmap, which is supposed to be shown on the on a browser, which is like a, a screen which used to be 96 DPI in the old ages. So basically, they all think of pixels. So that's the basic unit of measurement, which is totally incorrect. If I if I take my phone, if I take another cell phone, if I take a high res uh, LCD, if I take a, a big screen, which is going to be low res in terms of DPI, uh, the unit of measurement as a pixel is totally useless. What I want to have is I want to have a line which is like five millimeters thick, no matter what, where I look it at. Now, none of these rendering tools uh, that come with or that are around OpenStreetMap actually have this ability uh, to, for you to specify, uh, say, a, a width of, uh, of a, in a target device size. So we had to do a lot of uh, uh, circumvention, basically, like coming, uh, basically we, are, we ended up pre-processing these styling uh, documents uh, according to the particle uh, particle rendering that we want to do, and then basically we are from sort of a template styling document, we are pre-generating the styling document that gonna, uh, that's going to that's going to work with Geo tools. And then there is another uh, nasty problem, which means that uh, in some cases, when uh, and especially with the airspaces, uh, you want to have the, these what you saw in it's it's called the the internal buffer. Basically, you want to have a thickness uh, around the airspace, like a which is usually uh, either slanted lines or, or if it's a, it's a transparent color. Now, this buffer definition in the styling language is, is uh, they didn't really think about it when they created it. So the unit of measurement for this buffer is the unit of measurement of the coordinate <laughs> reference system that is being used in the post-GIS, which is underneath the whole thing, which, which basically means, it's a long phrase to say, it, it's a useless uh, 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 it's a totally useless uh, unit of measurement. So we have to uh, pre-calculate this unit of measurement into a useful target device size thing as well. Uh, so let's, yeah, I just wanted to get back to this box image again. So basically here you can see the, the problems that you want to have this. So if you want to zoom out, you want to you wanna have the very same thickness of the line here, which is totally impossible with these tools now. And you want to have the same thickness for the roads as well, because just for the reason that you're looking at a larger area, it also the, your eyes are going to be the same, right? So you want to have the, the same symbology with the same thickness. Okay, so this is uh, one of the big pains that we have experienced. Now, um, okay, so what we can do with rendering, we can render web-based maps, which, which you can use. We can render paper maps. This is a shrink down screenshot of uh, the one of the paper maps that we have. This, If you print it, this is like this big... Uh, and you can take it with you. And then we have an Android app, and I'm going to show you a small video about what our Android app does. Mm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope this is visible a little bit. So this is a test flight around Budapest, uh, where we were like, you know, checking out what our Android app is doing, and you can see us, uh, the cell phone and the tablet, uh, looking at what we have. So that's kind of reality out there. And then, uh, if it's not visible, then you can also come to the screen again if you wanna. I don't know if if it's enjoyable at all. Uh, yeah, let, let's yeah, let's do that. Come here, and then you can see on the screen. Yeah, so that's my friend R on there, and uh, so this is like the airport where we're taking off from, and then that's the airfield itself. Uh, so this is like the airplane, and that's the river we're flying over. So this, uh, the, the Android version is offline because you don't have internet uh, up in the air and it shows your real world position uh, on the map itself. 
so you can like see where you are and then uh, yeah basically navigate like that so this is like the previous area that I showed the images from uh, and this is the other side of this area you're gonna see Margaret Island in front there and people who know Budapest this is Váci Út and so yeah that's the main idea that you you know, have this tool in your hand and it tells you where you are and it draws you all the uh, uh, air spaces and stuff that you need to avoid or you need to know where you're at. Okay, so here are some screenshots on, of the Android app as well. It's uh, free to download uh, from Google Store. And actually with this project, we won the open source prize, project of the year prize in Hungary earlier this year. Uh, okay, and, and then we have a sort of a prototype for, uh, for, uh, for an additional uh, representation, which is a WebGL-based viewer. It's uh, based on Cesium, which is a WebGL-based virtual globe environment. So it's written in JavaScript and it uses OpenGL. So yeah, so just to show you a difference of how this, so this is like the, the bitmap render map that we've seen earlier. And this is basically an early prototype screenshot of the WebGL based thing. So you, have, you see the mountains and stuff, and then you see the, the airspace in 3D there. Uh, and this is the same thing with the, I don't know if it's visible, with the uh, satellite imagery underneath. Uh, and I can also show you, I'm, I think I'm still in time, so I can also show you. Uh, yeah, so this is it in motion. So for example now, yeah, you can, you know, look at all the, do you see anything there? No. So I'll, I'll invite you to the laptop again. So this is, uh, say, the same area. And uh, yeah, this is kind of the airspace that we've been looking at. And you can like you know come in and you see the hills and everything, and now it's all 3D correct. Uh, basically, it is telling you where the airspaces are and uh, and where you should go or you should not be going. And it also has so it's, it shows like a lot of airspace around. And it also has this feature, which basically it's a it's a simple initial KML support where it can uh, retrospectively show where you've been flying. So this is like an actual flight path, recorded flight path. Uh, which this is, KML, this is KML. So basically, the airplane, uh, or you can write the recorder yourself. Uh, so this is like a flight to the Lake Balaton around uh, the Balaton area, and uh, and for example, here you can see that this is an environmental uh, airspace zone, and then we have been kind of skimming the top of it a little bit into it as well. So this is a peninsula of Tihany. Uh, so it's kind of a tool that, that wishes to show the airspaces that your navigation points, and it also you can use it for post analysis. So you can like review where you've been, if you've been, you know, if you have followed the procedures properly, etc. So that's this is kind of a prototype thing now. We have. Okay. Now, uh, so. Let's let me talk about our aims and goals. Basically, what we're gonna do now, because we have uh, Hungary covered. Um, basically, what what we wanna do is that we wanna uh, uh, enter all the data which is rela relevant to Europe. Uh, so basically, covering all the 20, 20 odd uh, European countries, and we wanna do this by uh, converting data from these official publication. And there is a lot of data which is scattered around, like there is an open or the our airports project, which has a huge airport data set. There's this, uh, there is this uh, file format called uh, Open Air, which is uh, non-comprehensive, but it, but it's a lot of uh, uh, airspaces written there. So we want to import a lot of data from here and then kind of uh, review it, uh, sort of proof it to see that uh, all the information has been entered. And then we want to create uh, new tools as well. So currently, uh, data entry is very tedious. We, are, we were using JOSM, which comes with from OpenStreetMap, and then entering these airspace data there. It's, uh, it's quite laborious. So we want to have an online tool, which is uh, similar to ID for OpenStreetMap, where you could just 
click and just enter info through a web browser, so you don't need to download and run a specific tool for that. Uh, we want to improve on our rendering because I'm still very annoyed by how this whole bitmap rendering thing is working. And then, of course, we want to finish the 3D visualization in the browser, and then if we want to do 3D visualization in, in uh, tablets as well. So there the idea would be that you hold up your tablet or phone, and it shows you in an augmented reality way where things are. And this would be especially beneficial if you put this into a Google Glass or something like that, then it's kind of hands-free. So you just as you look around, you see where you're at, where you're heading, especially useful for hand gliders, for example, because they have their hands full. They don't have a lot of... Uh, so the last slide, which is not visible either. Uh, so anyway, what we are looking for is that we, we need more volunteers to the project. This is uh, basically my final point. So it's kind of an exciting and cool thing to do. Uh, but but we are seriously understaffed. So we, uh, if you if you fancy any of you know working on any of these things like spatial data or aviation data, then feel free to contact us. Thank you. Have you considered involving the flight simulator community because they have the same issues? If we have involved the flight simulator community, uh, uh, um, yes and no. Um, I'm an X-Plane user myself. Uh, so in X-Plane, it's a, it's a cross-platform commercial simulator. Uh, so you have a lot of data there as well, but not all. Of, so it's kind of a... a mm, let me put it this way, they are, they are very uh, cautious about the data set they have, and they are very proud that they have co you know, collected a lot of aviation nav data throughout the years. So, and this also means that we are very reluctant to share this with anyone. That's kind of a problem. But, but what I was thinking about is because you can also write plugins for X-Plane, I'm sure for, for MS Flight Simulator as well, that basically if you, if you know this, this kind of a, a replaying a, a flight that you had, you could do it in the simulator as well, which is fun. Because it's, it's quite eerie. It could work both ways. They yeah. Yeah, and actually, just uh, this week we got an offer from a, from a US guy who has a, a similar project which runs on iOS. So basically, he said that he would want to open source it, and most probably this would mean that he would join this project with his iOS app. So then we would have an iOS application as well, not just an Android one. So that would be also a big boost for, for Apple. Yeah. How often does this thing uh, change? Uh, how often do you have to update this? Yeah, these publications come out from the state authority maybe three or four times a year. And it's uh, pre-scheduled, so it's uh, it's not that imminently there is something going on, but you already know that there's going to be a new publication in September, another one in December. It's about three or four times a year per country, and uh, it, the, the changes are already available three months, usually three months before they become effective, so you have a lot of time to, to, uh, to gather them. And uh, the amount of change is usually not that much. So the big push is the initial data entry, and then just updating the, the data with the new changes is, is then quite easy. How much effort did you need to make? Well, I, I, I took the hard route, which meant that I, I was parsing uh, uh, XML files which are not created for machine processing at all. Uh, so there's a lot of heuristics and stuff, because I thought that this is the good way to go. Uh, in hindsight, no manual entry is much <laughs> shorter. <laughs> so I think this parsing code, I mean, this is a project I'm doing in my free time. So when I'm talking calendar time, it doesn't mean I was working full time on it, full time on it. But it took me about three months free time to, uh, uh, I mean, calendar time to write this uh, import, which only works for Hungary, because it's a lot of special cases that has to be handled, because the whole uh, documentation is a mess that they publish. Um, so I, I, I would reckon that actually manual data entry would have worked in one month or less. So How many records are among the data uh, About 100. So I would say maybe uh, 50 airspaces, maybe 50 naviga 40 navigation points. And, and, uh, uh, and the officially only about eight airports in Hungary, in, relative, in reality about 50. So there's also a discrepancy between the official publications and what's, what are, what's out there in reality. So it's not a lot of data points. Uh, the tedious ones are these ones which follow the river or follow the, the, the borderline and that kind of stuff. But you have the ter terrain data that you get it from? 
turn, da turn data is available, and uh, but it's uh, when you just draw the 2D map, it doesn't help you because you because you just you know re reflect the original definition, which says a thousand feet above ground level, and then the pilot should know. Uh, with 3D rendering, you need the turn data, but it's that's available, so you can use the uh, the SRTM data, or you can use the the, the Japanese the JAXA Japanese Space Agency data, and that's widely available. That's not a big issue. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.